I'd like to welcome again uh, Billy Pearson to our church and the pulpit. Uh, he's on loan from the Crowley Church today, and his wife, Blanca, is with him, and we welcome her as well. And believe it or not, I know this would be very difficult to believe, but the young man with him is their grandson. So wonders never cease. Uh, but we're so grateful. Billy, I understand, during the week, just to earn a living, builds airplanes. But his real passion is sharing the word of God. Welcome. Thank you, Bernard. Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath. I recognize several of you guys' faces. It's been a little while. I don't know how long it's been. What has it been, a year since I've been here? Don't even remember. I don't either. It's been a year. Forgive me if I don't remember y'all's names. Y'all having fellowship lunch today? Yes, sir. All right. When I join y'all and I ask you, can you tell me your name again? Don't be offended. <laughs> a year is a long time. Uh, believe it or not, I know that uh, I have a grandson already, but uh, my memory is like everyone else's when they get older. You know how that's going. Well, uh, the title of today's sermon is Understanding God's Love. And I know for a lot of kids today, you're probably questioning, you know, hey, I don't understand my own love, right? Much less God's love. Because a lot of you possibly haven't been in love yet, right? Right? I hope not. Wait, wait, guys, until you're at least 40, maybe 50. <laughs> but when I was young and when you were young, it's hard for us to even understand our own parents' love, right? And we have a tendency to compare our parents' love to how God loves us. And some kids, you know, struggle with that. And I know I struggle with that. My dad was an atheist, and we didn't hug a whole lot in our family. We didn't hug a whole lot. Actually, I'm going to be honest, we didn't hug at all. So we went to this church, me and my wife, for about six years called the Cowboy Church out there in Joshua Adventist Church. Y'all heard of it? Very nice church. It has a nickname, the Hugging Church. When you walk in the door, the ladies will hug you right when you walk in the door if you're new, no matter who you are. First time they hugged me, I just kind of tensed up like this, you know? I was like this, didn't know what to do. Six years later, I was hugging back. My brothers and family come over to my house now for Christmas. I wrap my arms around them and hug them. Uh, welcome new members into our church. I'll hug them. One day, uh, me and my wife got to do the greeting at the door, and instead of shaking hands, we were hugging, and they did the same thing. They were kind of like this. <laughs> Even though they were members of the church, they were like, what are y'all doing to me? You know? So, so we, we said, okay, we won't hug everybody. We'll shake some hands and hug some others, and then we'll do the one-arm hug. But it's hard for us to understand, you know, because when I was a kid, I, I compared God's love to how my dad and my mom loved me. I mean, that's not fair, is it? And the, the truth is, the secret is, even as parents, we don't understand God's love either. We don't fully understand God's love. God's love is an awesome thing. It's something that we can pursue for all eternity. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? We get to pursue God's love for all eternity. There's only one person that ever walked the face of this earth that we know of that fully understood God's love, and that is Jesus. And that's why Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Because Jesus, God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus are what we like to call the Trinity, right? And the best way I can explain the Trinity to some of y'all, especially the little ones, a lot of y'all probably heard this interpretation, is it's kind of like a glass of ice water. It's called a glass of ice water. It's a singular thing. You call it a glass of ice water, but you have a glass, you have the ice, and you have the water. And all three of those things make a glass of ice water. And the same thing with the Trinity. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each have a different responsibility, but they all make up God. So Jesus fully understood and understands God's love. So today I want to talk to you about understanding God's love and not that before we start off in a word of prayer, not that I think that before, by the end of today, you're going to say, oh, well, thank you, Mr. Pearson. I fully understand God's love because that's something for us to chase and pursue for, for eternity. And we're going to find that out here in just a minute. But what I want you to also understand is the misunderstandings about God's love. And by covering some of the misunderstandings about God's love, It'll help us to better understand God's love. So hopefully by the end of this sermon, we'll have a better understanding of God's love. So let's start off with a word of prayer. Dear most gracious, dear Heavenly Father, Father, I just want to say thank you, Lord. What a privilege it is, Father, to be here today. What a privilege, privilege it is today, Father, to be your words and to be your lips, Father. And Father, what a privilege it is to know you. 
And Father, today we want to hear from you. We want to hear a word from you, Father. We want to know you more. We want to understand you more. We want to grow closer to you, Father. And so, Father, as we do this today, Father, we can't do it without you. Without you, Father, this is just a room with a bunch of people in it, Father. But with you, Father, we are the body of Christ. So, Father, we pray for your presence. We pray for your love. We pray for your understanding. We pray for your blessings. We pray for your Holy Spirit to fall down upon us today, Father, and to touch our hearts, to move our hearts, to move us in your direction to understanding you, Father. Father, what an awesome thing it is. Father, it is something you want us to know, something you want us to understand, Father. Father, as we lift up Jesus, we lift up the Father. And when we lift up the Father, we lift up the Son. And so, Father, we've come here today, I have come here today to lift up Jesus, to lift up God, and to know you more, and to have a better understanding and a better relationship with you, Father. Father, I want to know you. I want to pursue you. We want to know you. We've come here today to hear from you, not me, to hear from you, your words, your lips. We need your ears. We need your understanding, Father. We need your presence. We need the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we humbly come before you today, that after this sermon is over today, that we leave here, Father, with a better understanding of you and a closer relationship with you and a better walk. And through these things, Father, might we have a better life here on earth, but also that we'll be able to make it into the clouds of heaven through this walk, through this relationship. So when we get to the gates, Father, you will say, welcome in, my son. I know you. And so, Father, that's what we're here today to, to do. Not to speak fancy words, Father, not to show fancy PowerPoints, Father, but to lift up Jesus to bring us closer to you. And so, Father, we ask for your presence. We ask for your Holy Spirit. I ask, I humbly ask, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, one of the misunderstandings about God's love is how does the world perceive me? How does the world look at me and how does the world love me? And better yet, do I love myself? How does God love me? I mean, if, if I don't love myself and the world doesn't love me, we sometimes say, well, how can God love me? You know, how, how can God love me? Look what I've done. Or why does God love me? Look what I've did. And so we begin to question the how and the why. But see, the how and the why is like trying to understand how is God God and why is God God? And we don't need to understand the how and the why. We just need to know that God is God and that God does exist. And the same thing with God's love. We don't need to question how God could love me and why God could love me. We just need to know that God does love me and that God is love. Because understanding God's love is a mystery. It's a mystery for something for us. Yes. My little grandbaby. I think Nana will help you with that. He wants his little toy doll, Susie. So... Understanding God's love is a bit of a mystery for us. It is a big mystery for us, and it's something that we get to pursue for all eternity. And listen what Ellen White says about this. This is very interesting what she says about this, to prove that fact. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. He was the word of God, God thoughts made audible. In his prayer for his disciples, he says, I have declared unto them thy name, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. But not alone for his earthborn children was this revelation given. Did y'all know that? Not just for us. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. Wow. Did y'all know that? Our world is a lesson book for the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of, re mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look. Even angels desire to look at this fascinating love of God. And it will be their study throughout endless ages. That's eternity. Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. You can't catch God's love. 
You can't catch up with God's love. You can run as fast as you can, but God's love left the train station a long time ago, and it's traveling faster than you. And what I mean is, God's love started way, 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 way before anything even began. God's love was with him, and it's traveling faster than you. That means if we're in an eternity and we're in heaven, you could be there and you think, oh, this is the prime of God's love. This is the ultimate prime of God's love. It doesn't get any better than this. And each and every day, God will do something to show you he loves you more and more and more. Ain't that fascinating? With my love, you could study my love and you could say, hey, this is where his love begins and this is where his love ends. He just doesn't, we've studied his love, and he just doesn't love in these areas. You could actually find there's things in life I just don't love. But God's love, it's endless. You can't catch God's love. I mean, how dull would the universe be if we got to heaven and we just figured out everything about God, we knew everything about God, and we just say, okay, we're done. But for all eternity, we get to pursue God's love. We get to chase after God's love and pursue God's love because God's love is a mystery to us and always will be a mystery. So here's something that, that proves that point, that God's love has been around for a long time. Now, we've all read John 3.16, and it was the scripture reading for today. So you don't have to look it up, right? We all know it. So see if you can catch this. See if you can catch this verbiage that Jesus said here. You ready to say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Did you catch it? Did y'all catch it? It was fast. Sometimes when we read scripture, what we have a tendency to do is we have a tendency just to read it, and then we take it at face value, and we say, okay, this is just what it means. But sometimes we have to look a little bit deeper into the very words that Christ gives us to find out what is he saying right here. You see, Jesus said this over 2,000 years ago, and we know that God loves us, but what Jesus said is God loved us. What Jesus was saying was before the earth was creation, created, before the foundation of the world, before the galaxies, before anything existed, before God created anything, you were the first thing on his mind. God loved you first, and then he had a plan of salvation. Do you think God created the plan of salvation and said, hmm, I have a plan of salvation, but who's this plan of salvation for? Let's create people <laughs> and then we'll create a scenario and then we'll have this perfect plan of salvation for the people God his first thought on his mind was you and then God had a plan of salvation God loved you so much he sent his only begotten son now you don't think God's random do you are we random we're God's children right are we random we can be random, but let me ask you a question. As builders, when they built this building, do you think that they just showed up with some random wood and just, they just randomly showed up with some random tools and random things and they just started slapping things together when they got finished? There was this church, right? And when I build airplanes at work, do you think we just show up and we go, oh, I randomly brought this and you randomly brought that and we just randomly brought some things and out rolls, rolls this perfectly nice new airplane, right? It takes blueprints and it takes planning. God planned us. Thousands and thousands, we don't even know how long ago, you were the first thought on God's mind. It was not random. God was not random. It isn't like God just said, okay, you know what? He said, you know what? I think I'm going to create some things. God said, I'm going to create a world. You know what? Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to create galaxies. Poof, there's galaxies. I'm going to create a world. Poof, there's a world. I'm going to create water and put water because the, the ground is real. I'm going to put water on. Then I'm going to put uh, fish in the water. And then I'm going to put, you know, uh, land. Poof, and then there's animals. Poof, and then he creates all these things. And he's standing around with Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. And they're all standing around there looking at this beautiful zoo, by the way. Nothing's on it but animals. And they're looking at it and they're like, wow, this is so awesome. This is so beautiful, but something, you know, God, something is just missing. Something is just not right with this scenario. Something is missing. He says, oh, you know what? You know what? Maybe we should put people on here. You think God was just randomly did that? No, everything that you see, everything out there, God created for you. You were the first thought. He created the planet so that you would have a place to live. He created air so that you could breathe. He created water so that you could drink. He created the sun so that things would grow, so that you would have light. God, you know how we give our little kids, we give them a light, night light at night because they're scared. 
God created a nightlight the size of Texas. It's called the moon. What if there was no lights in the sky and there was no stars and the sun went down? What would it look like? Pitch black. God created these stars for depth and perception. Stars, entire stars that are useless other than the fact he created them for you for depth and perception to let you know that you're not, that there's depth and that you're just not sitting in this black space and you don't know what it is when the sun goes down. God did all of that for you because he loved you. You were the first thought on his mind. You were the first thought on God's mind before anything. He thought of you first. You were part of his blueprint and you were a part of his plan. He foreknew you before the foundation of the world and he loved you and he laid the plan of salvation for you. And that's how awesome God is. And don't take my word for it. Let's look it up. Turn with me if you would. Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. And let's see what it says here. Y'all with me, brothers and sisters? All right. Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. It says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as He chose in Him, us in Him, excuse me, before the foundation of the world. Did you hear that? That we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. That means He chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy in Him. That's amazing, in love. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasures of his will. God loved us before the foundations of the world. And this is one thing I love about the creation story. You read creation story, and the first day God is creating, and and God the Father and the Holy Spirit, they're creating the things. And as the second day and the third day, he begins to say, it is good. It is good. And then third, fourth day, it is good. Fifth day, it is good. And the sixth day, guess who comes onto the scene? Me and you. And then what does he say? It is very good. Now all this stuff that I created, it has purpose and it has reason. Because you are there. Without you, none of it has any purpose and none of it has any reason. It was all for you. If you want to feel God's love, walk outside on a warm sunny day and just stand there and look around and just feel the sun that he put in there for you and look at the beautiful flowers and the grass and the trees because God loved you. He did all this for you because God loves us. You know, I have a friend and a friend told me this story once and I'm going to tell it to you and, and it's pretty profound. It's very profound and, and you can believe it or you can not believe it because this happened in a dream. But you know what? It's very, very profound story. This gentleman, he's a family member of mine, and, and I had no reason to question him because he earnestly and honestly, and I had no reason why he would make such a thing up. But he told me this. He said, one night I had a dream, and I was laying there, and I'm a jailer in real life. He's a jailer in real life, a county jailer. And he said he's sitting there, and this time except for he's the one sitting in jail. And he looks up, and he sees one looks like Jesus, like the Son of God. And he says, suddenly, instantly, everything goes black. And he says, it wasn't just a regular black. This was a black, black, darker than any black that he had ever seen. He says, everything went pitch black, like unconsciousness black. And he opened his eyes, and he was standing there in front of a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful valley of grass, in front of a beautiful tree, in front of beautiful water. And he said, it was so beautiful, and it was so perfect, he said, he could not even describe it to me. He said it was unbelievable. He said the grass was just swaying. It was just so beautiful and glistening and and golden. He said it went all the way up to the edge of the water. Now, I don't know what he was struggling with in his life. But I do know he plays a lot of video games. And he goes off into another world in his video games. He likes to play those world games where there's many dimensions in world, EverQuest or something. So he kind of lives in another world, you know. But God shows him something real. And he says... Right before I woke up, the next thing I heard before I woke up was a voice said to me behind me as if someone was standing behind me. He said, is it good enough? Pretty profound, isn't it? Is it good enough? Is it good enough? Is heaven good enough for what we have to go through here on earth? Will it be good enough? And here's what's interesting about this to me. This is what's interesting. He has a dream where I believe God shows him just a glimpse, just a glimpse. And God shows me a glimpse one night. 
I'm laying there and I'm at my mom's house. Now, I have no idea. I'm 45 years old, but every time I dream I'm at somebody's house, I'm at my mom's house. Can y'all relate? I have no idea why. But I'm at my mom's house and suddenly I see the sky roll back. I go into a, a blackness and I wake up my eyes. Except for this time, it's different than what he sees. What I see is just people. I don't see heaven. I just see people. And they say to me, you're here and you made it. I'm going to tell you, whether it was real or whether it was not, in my conscience and in my soul, I felt something. And what I felt was no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more death, no more trying to wonder if I'm going to make it to heaven or not. I was there, and it was confirmed. And they said, you're here, and you made it. And it lasted that long, and I woke up. But that split second was the greatest second of my entire life, and I will pursue that for the rest of my life until I finally get there and I hear that true voice say to me, you are here and you are made it. And it was heaven to me, and it wasn't heaven because of the surroundings. It was heaven because Jesus was there. Is it good enough? The question is, is it good enough? Is what we have to go through on here earth, is your pain and your suffering and your sorrow and your depression and things that we're going through in life, is it worth the wait for heaven? Because sometimes what we have a tendency to do is we have a tendency as we cry out to God, we're going through pain, we're going through sorrow, we're going through suffering, and we cry out to God and we cry out to God and we cry out and we say, God, are you listening? Do you hear me, God? Because the silence... It just keeps getting louder and louder and louder. And we say, God, do you even care about me, God? Do you love me, God? Do you care about me? Turn with me, if you would, to John, um, excuse me, Luke 719. I want to talk a little bit about John the Baptist. John the Baptist had an experience like this. He had an experience very similar to this. John the Baptist had been thrown in prison by Herod's wife. And John the Baptist is sitting in prison. And if anybody knew Jesus, well, it was John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist knew Jesus. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. He knew Jesus. And John the Baptist, if we read when Jesus comes onto the scene. Now, we know whenever... Ever Abraham went up the mountain with Isaac, he says, Father, we have the wood and we have everything for the sacrifice, but where's the lamb? Right? Well, guess what? Thousands of years later, or hundreds or however long it was later, John the Baptist sees Jesus, answers Isaac's question, and says, he could have said anything. He could have said, look, that's Jesus, my cousin. But John the Baptist says, there is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you think John got who Jesus was? Yes, he says it. There's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So this is John the Baptist. This is Jesus' cousin. He knows who Jesus is. He knows that Jesus is the Savior. There was no doubt in his mind he was sent for a mission to do something, and that was to spread that the, the, the Messiah was coming and to prepare the hearts of man. So he knew this was Jesus. Now here's John the Baptist. He's sitting in prison and some time goes by and he begins to wait and he begins to wait and he begins to wait crying out to God are you listening and he begins to wait and then something happens and brothers and sisters what happens to John the Baptist if I said that it never happened to me I would be lying he begins to doubt are you listening God do you care about me, Jesus? Jesus was just a walking distance away from John the Baptist. John the Baptist is sitting in prison. Do you care about me, Jesus? So John the Baptist sends word to Jesus. And when John the Baptist sends word to Jesus, this is what they say. Starting in verse 19. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Whoa, wait a minute, John the Baptist. Hang on a minute, John the Baptist. There's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Are you the coming one or should we wait for another? Do you see it, Do you see it there? Hold on a minute. There's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Are you the coming one or should we wait for another? Has that ever happened to you? 
Have you ever in one moment in your life been lifting up Jesus and lifting up God and saying how wonderful God is to everybody because everything's on your up and up and everything's going your way and then suddenly things aren't quite going your way and you begin to cry out in your suffering and your pain and in your sorrow and you begin to say, God, are you there? Are you listening to me, God? Are you even God? Are you the Lamb of God? Or should we wait for another? He begins to cry out. He begins to doubt. So Jesus says something to him very interesting. Jesus says this, moving down to verse 22. Jesus answered and said to him, Go and tell them the things we have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor and the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Jesus didn't say, Hey, go tell John there's a prison break coming soon. The doors are going to be flung open and you're going to be let out and my kingdom's going to rise up, John. Go tell John that everything's going to be perfect, that there's going to be heaven here on earth. No. He says, John, Scripture has been fulfilled. You are right. I am the Messiah. I am the coming one. Scripture has been fulfilled, John. Do you think John had any doubt then? No. John knew right then Scripture had been fulfilled, that he was the Messiah. John had no more doubt. So John begins to sit in this prison and he begins to wait and he begins to wait some more and he begins to wait and guess what? More time frame goes by and he waits and he waits and he waits and then suddenly one day, come with me, John. They took John and put his head on a chopping block. I don't know how they cut it off, but they cut John's head off. Now, is there many people today standing up for Jesus Christ Standing up for God today and experiencing the same thing. Not losing their faith, but faith, but yet losing their head. John didn't lose his faith, but John lost his head. And we know that revelations, I don't know when this time will come, but we know there'll be a period of time where people will experience that very thing. And it is happening today as we speak. Where will you stand? Is it good enough? Heaven good enough for the pain, the sorrow, and the suffering that you have to experience here in Satan's kingdom. Is it good enough? Is it good enough? Yes, it is. And so what happened with John, that, 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 that voice that he waited for, also happened to someone else in the Bible we're going to talk about. And this person that it happened to, this personage that it happened to, will never happen again. All of history could go by. The universe, the, the eternity could go by. Everything could go by. And this one incident, this one thing that happened in time will never, ever, ever, ever happen again. It will never happen again. And that's Jesus. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what we like to picture Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is one gospel says he knelt down to pray. Right. And so we picture this nice, pretty image of Jesus and he's just, you know, he's just kneeling down and he's all, you know, in this perfect image and he's praying to his father. Father, take this cup from me. Right. No. If you read Matthew, it says he fell on his face. He cried out, Father, Father, please, Abba, Father, take this cup from me. If there's any other way, God, if there's any other way, if there is plan B, God, let it be. But nevertheless, not my will, but let your will be done. But take this cup from me. He cries out, but the silence, there was no other plan. There was no other way. There was not a plan B for Jesus. There was a plan A, and this was the plan for Jesus. If you think that you, what you're going through that Jesus can't relate to, if you think this moment of silence where God's plan is going to be played out, whether we like it here on earth, whether it causes pain, whether it causes suffering, if you think that Jesus cannot relate to what you're going through, you need to check yourself again because Jesus can relate to what we go through. And he cried out, Father, if there's any other way. He was in such duress that doctors tell us it's possible that capillaries in his eyes could have burst or his capillaries in his skin could have burst but I do know this it said his sweat fell to the ground like drops of blood whether it was literal blood or not but I do know that if you put yourself somewhere up here in the extremities that blood would run down your hand and it would find the furthest point closest to the ground which would probably be your middle finger and it would just drop to the ground in giant drops 
just drop, drop. I mean, if you cut yourself severely, it's just going to almost run off the end of your finger. And I picture Jesus there, and he's sweating, and it's like giant drops of blood just pouring off of him to the ground. Whether it was actual blood or whether it was sweat, either way around, he was in extreme duress. Father, Father, if there's any way, take this cup from me. Three times he went and fell on his face. Three times he prayed. And so Jesus goes to the cross. Now, did an angel come and comfort Jesus? Absolutely. Did Jesus send word back to John the Baptist to comfort John? Absolutely. Will Jesus comfort you in your time of need? Absolutely. Does it always mean you'll be rescued? Does it mean that, that, that when we're standing there and we're in our duress that, that we're not going to experience? No, but Jesus sends a comforter. God always sends a comforter. God sent a comforter to be with Jesus. And he comforted him and told him, it is good enough. Heaven is worth it. Eternity is worth it. It is worth it. So Jesus goes to his cross, and he's there on the cross, and he says something. He says, Father, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken Jesus? We know that God cannot look upon sin. When God looked down and he seen his son, he seen me and you. He's seen that plan that he laid out from plan from day one. He's seen me and you there on that cross. He's seen us there on that cross. Why have you forsaken me? Forsaken him for who? Brothers and sisters, for you. For you. The separation between Jesus and the Father had never happened ever before. He had always been in the presence of his Father. He had always felt the presence of his Father. But God cannot look upon sin. And so that moment in time where the silence of his Father was just too loud, while he was there on the cross, it was that day. He was on the cross for you because he loved you. Why have you forsaken me? For who? For you. Because that was the plan. That was the only plan. There was no other way. This was the plan of salvation because God loved us before the foundation of the world. That He sent His Son to die on that cross for you. Everything is about the cross. You know what this is? This is lamina. This is what holds your body together. You take this out of your body, you will cease to exist. And it's so small you can't see it. Can you even see it in a microscope? I don't know, but it's very small. And then you look at a whirlpool galaxy, and there's the cross. What he's saying to me is even from the micro to the macro, it's all about the cross. It's all about Jesus. It's all about God's love for you. Because God loved us, brothers and sisters, and God loves us. No matter what you're going through and what you're experiencing, He knows and He cares even when the silence is too loud. You're not the only one. Turn with me, if you would, to Jeremiah. I mean, excuse me, Romans 8, 28. And it's interesting because several times we've touched on the sermon today, and here's another incident where y'all touched on the sermon today I thought was really awesome. Romans 8, 28 to verse 32. When you're going through something in your life, and the silence is too loud, and you're experiencing something and you just don't know, how am I going to get through this? But, let me turn to it myself here. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to His purposes. I'm going to read on, but you know, John the Baptist was there on the cross. Excuse me, John the Baptist was there. We're getting his head cut off. But you know what? We know that when Christ returns, even if it's a hundred years, even if it's a thousand years, no matter what long period of time it will be, right there, right that second, when you close your eyes in death, whether it be a hundred years or a thousand years before the resurrection, your next thought will be opening your eyes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. O oh, death, where is your sting? There is no death for the righteous. There is no second death for the righteous. There is no eternal death for the righteous. If I was to drop dead right here on this pulpit, whether it be a thousand years or a hundred years before the resurrection, I would close my eyes in death and I would waken them 
within a split second in my mind to the resurrection. Oh, death, where is your sting? And then I would live for eternity with God. John the Baptist may have went to his death, but John the Baptist closed his eyes in death and opened his eyes in the resurrection. Oh, death, where is your sting? All things work for good for those who love God. Even what Satan is trying to attempt on this earth, even the most devious, most evil things that Satan is doing upon this earth, even the things that we heard about just the other night, the killings and the murderers, believe it or not, all things work for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Even Satan's total destruction of, of, of many of mankind, God's children, still brings glory to God. Because of Jesus. Jesus brings glory to God. Jesus brings glory to the Father. Even though Satan tried to corrode God's name, even though he put a veil over God for thousands of years and lied to all of mankind and said, oh, and even lied to a third of the angels and lied to them and told them, oh, you don't know God. I'm behind the veil. I'm the cherub. I get to be in the presence. You don't know God. This is really who God is. And one third of the angels actually believed him. And a lot of mankind has also believed that God's unfair. But then Jesus comes to this earth, and he walks this earth, and he shows us God. He shows us the character of God, the love of God, the love that he had for his father, and the love that his father had for him. The veil has been torn. Reading on, it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to those things? If God is for us, who can be against us, brothers and sisters? If God is for you, who can be against you? God is for you. If you're going out and you're evangelizing and you're trying to preach and you're trying to speak and you're reaching out to the neighborhood and you feel the doors slamming in your face and you feel that people aren't listening, you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. God is with you. Know this, brothers and sisters. He has not left you. He has not forsaken you. He forsook his son that moment on the cross for you, but he has not forsaken you. He's there with you every moment of the way. It's what he wants us to be doing and reaching out to his family, reaching out to his people. And when you do this, he's with you. God is with you. And if God is with you, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the pain, regardless of the suffering, regardless of the sorrow, regardless of the rejection, if God is for you, who can be against you? No one. No one. Because the God of the universe is with you. And God is with us because he loved us so much that he created all of this, all of it, the very ground you're standing on for you, the air you breathe for you because he loved you. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Praise God, amen, all things. I can't wait. Can you? Heaven is going to be glorious and beautiful, brothers and sisters. We don't even know. We don't even know. We have no idea how beautiful and glorious heaven is going to be. It's going to be so awesome for the first time in our entire lives. You will truly know your purpose. In heaven, when you walk on grass, do you think it falls dead after you walk on it? you think a flower will fall dead after you walk on it? No, because the purpose of that flower is to live. You can walk on it all day long, and it's going to live. It's not going to die. So the question is, what is your purpose? When you get to heaven, you will have a purpose. And you will have a perfect purpose. And you will serve your perfect purpose. And you will be happy. You won't be sitting on a cloud playing harps. Heaven is going to be a beautiful, glorious place. And in the endless universe that stretches from one end to the other that we can't get to the end of, He created for you. For you. And you ain't even seen none of it yet. You've just seen this earth. You just... And you ain't even seen the earth in all of its glory. Wait till he's done. So brothers and sisters, this is real love. It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. So if there's any, anything that you leave today with, I want you to know this. God loves you. God loves you. Do you hear me? 
God loves you. No one drug his hands to the cross. No one took his hand and drug it from one end to the other. His arms are stretched out open wide for a reason because that's you in his arms. He willingly opened his arms. He willingly put his arms on the cross for you. God loves you and he is with you. Let us pray. Dear most gracious, dear heavenly Father, Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for, for all that you've done for us, Father. Father, we thank you for dying on the cross for our sins, Father. And Father, no matter what we're going through here on earth, Father, it is worth it. It is good enough. Heaven will be good enough. Father, what a wonderful, wonderful day it will be. All of heaven will sing, Father. Even the things under the earth, under the water, and in the earth will sing that glorious day. All of the earth groans for that glorious day when you return and take us home, Father. So, Father, we long for that day. So, Father, be in our hearts. Be in anyone's heart here today that has any doubt, Father, struggling, whether it be through depression or they feel rejection, Father. Father, they haven't been rejected. You haven't rejected them. You love them with all of your heart. And so, Father, we thank you for that love. We thank you for that love that you've given to us. And may we go in peace here today and feel that warmth and that love. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.